friends, welcome back to this lecture number 9 on the series on human behavior. Now, today's topic of discussion would be human memory and what we are going to do is we are going to see how learning leads to memory and what is the need of memory, what are its functions and why should we be studying memory on a course on human behavior. That is what the next two lecture which is lecture number 9 and 10 would be doing. But as usual the things that we do before any lecture is recapping what we did in the past lectures. So, dwelling upon why did we start this course, so the course started because I wanted to explain to you what is human behavior and not only explain what is human behavior, I also wanted to give you a science or introduce to you to a science of studying human behavior that was psychology. So, we looked at in the first two lectures the reasons why do we actually need the science of psychology or why do we need to study human behavior. In those lectures we looked at the questions of how the science of human behavior which is psychology came in and we looked at how philosophy and physiology has its role to play into the study of human behavior and the nurturing or the upcoming science of psychology. Then we looked at the history of basic questions about human behavior both from the philosophical point of view and from the physiological point of view. Questions like what is soul, what is mind, what is brain, what is consciousness and those kinds of questions and how does psychology answer them. Because psychology was promised to be a scientific field. So, we looked at how does this science of psychology started and we did a little bit of work on to the schools of psychology, early schools of psychology, structuralism, functionalism, behaviorism, gestaltism and psychoanalysis. Then we looked at the newer schools of psychology like cognitive neuroscience and psycholinguistics, neurology or other interdisciplinary sciences which aids the study of human behavior and aid the study of psychology. Towards the end of this lecture we looked at how do we do psychological research and we looked at multiple methods. Uh, not limiting to only experimentation, but also extending to the idea of observation, a survey, a correlation and, and a literature review or single case studies. So, methods of doing psychological research. So, the first two chapters were dedicating in introducing the concept. Then once you know what psychology is and what it does, we started by looking at how does the human behavior emanate first of all. So, for human behavior to emanate to start you have to respond to in the something in the external environment and this responding to something in the external environment starts by first of all understanding the external environment or making a copy of the external environment and understanding it. Now, the first step in this process is grabbing the external environment or encoding the external environment in a way that humans understand it and there is the process of sensation. So, we looked at what is sensation, how does the sensory system works and we look at concepts related to the sensory system. So, what is sensitivity, what is sensory coding those kind of things and what are absolute threshold, differential threshold, signal detection theory, questions of sensory coding and so on and so forth that is what we looked at and how these sensory systems grab information from the environment and how it is translated into something which or encoded into something which the brain can understand. Then we took a model system which is the human eye and looked at how this model system encompasses or consists of or functions and encode the sensory uh, physical stimulus into the psychological realm. Further to that we looked at something called perception which is making interpretation. So, the sensory systems encode the physical environment into the psychological realm, but what makes meaning of the sensory stimulus is a process which is called perception. So, perception is organizing the sensory stimuluses and making meaning out of it. We looked at why is perception necessary and we looked at multiple theories of perception from the gestaltist uh, uh, view to uh, the Gibsonian view and to the interactionist view. So, different views of how perception really functions and then we moved on to something called the five steps of perception. We started by looking at what is attention, so attentional processes 
and looking at what is sustained and divided attention. The second step being localizing an object in the external simulation. So, localizing an object starts with understanding the figure background and then also uh, looking at monocular, binocular cues and depth perception and things like that. The third step being recognition where we focus on how information is recognized. So, once uh, the sensory systems pass on some information onto the perceptual system, how does the perceptual system make meaning? how do they recognize and so there are two steps into it one is the uh, the early model and the other is the late model in the early model basic information is gathered so primitive information uh, from the sensory organs are captured together and glued together in the next step this glued information is compared across a uh, standard uh, ideal or uh, representation which is already stored and so the two models help you into recognizing so, the first step is integration, the second step is pattern matching, these two steps in recognition. And then we have abstraction and constancy. So, in abstraction what happens is, how does this uh, perceptual system abstract information from the sensory system or abstract information from the sensory system. So, what is abstraction? Abstraction is getting only those information from the bunch of sensory stimuluses that, that uh, the perceptual system receives which is necessary for it to make any identification right. If you are looking at a face you just need the eye the uh, or some specific features of the face because eyes nose and that kind of thing is already stayed, stored into the uh, human memory or the perceptual system. So, you do not need to store those kind of information and that is how you distinguish person A from B. And then we have constancy which is maintaining certain constants right because constancy uh, is necessary for the human brain to make all kind of interpretations. The last two lectures were on learning. So, once you have this information, once you are integrating this information, you learn and so what we looked at is what is learning and uh, learning is a process through which we acquire knowledge and use this knowledge and so it is a relatively permanent change in behavior. So, which basically means that learning can also go back to no learning stage, it can also proceed to a yes learning stage. We looked at the two theories of learning which is classical conditioning which says that any behavior change happens through combining a reward before the behavior occurs and then th there is something called instrumental conditioning in which once you do the right behavior you are rewarded and as a consequence of this you keep on doing the behavior. So, we looked at both classical conditioning and instrumental conditioning and parameters for it. A third form of learning that we also did was called observation learning which is basically a form of learning in which the subject copies someone else a role model and by copying his acts he when he gets rewarded the person who is copying the behavior also does a similar act according to the model. If the model is not rewarded and he is punished the copying behavior is decreased and so that is what the observation learning. But whatever we learn needs to be saved somewhere and there is where the science of memory comes in that is where the existence of memory comes in. So, that is what memory is all about. So, what is memory basically? It is a store where you keep your information right. So, memory that is what uh, was believed of memory in the uh, first couple of years when memory research start, uh, started, it was thought of it as a store as a place where you keep on information. But then later on researchers uh, or researchers believe that it is not as simple as that, it is not just like an Almira where you can store things. There are two more processes to memory which is basically uh, the encoding process of how you feed in information and there is a retrieval process if is, that is how you take away information from the store. So, memory became a now a study of three part process. The science of memory started very early on. And the first research, scientific research in memory happened with the coming of Ibn Goss. But even before that, there was a lot of work on memory. Even during the philosophy days is, or the days when uh, psychology had not developed and philosophy was the major science which led to all of the sciences coming up, the people were interested in how somebody stores something. And so, the conceptualization of memory in those periods, on those days were in terms of a cave, in terms of a tablet because it was it was known that sometimes memory also get erased and so memory was thought of also as a vex tablet where something is written and then it can be erased. Memory was also thought of as a storage a cave where you can store information. It was thought of as a cupboard or 
Almira, where information can be stacked on one over the other. And so, these are the conceptualizations of memory uh, by the early philosophers. And later in the 19th century, 1950s, around 1950s, memory was thought of at as a when telephone was invented, it was thought of as a connection of networks or connection of one line to another, and that is how memory the information processing theory of memory started. So, what we will be doing in this lecture is not only introducing to you what memory is all about, we will also look at some theories of memory, some approaches to memory and then we will look into the idea of uh, memory uh, in terms of what can be stored and what cannot be stored. So, basically then let us start our definition of what is memory. Now, we will start our uh, lecture by looking at two interesting cartoons as you can see in this cartoon how is memory important he says that I want to help you recover my repressed memories I keep forgetting the multiplication table. So, here is a person he wants obviously the psychoanalyst here to recover memories for him. Similarly, in the second clip, uh, uh, clip you can see another ex interesting example of memory the place in my brain that should hold the knowledge of quantum physics instead hold the knowledge of the name of an actor who plays Johanna or join on happy days. And so, as you can see these are what the some interpretation of memory is. Why it is important? It is important. So, memory is not important to you because you have it. The moment you do not have memory then the problem arises. And so, there are several deficits or there are several cases in which people do not have memory. For example, short term memory you do not remember my after meeting someone what this person looks like or what this person is. And sometimes you have failures in long term memory where you cannot remember anything from your uh, past or anything from your past life. And so, the idea of memory or the existence of memory or the need for memory uh, comes in only when you do not have memory. So, let us quickly start up by looking at the definition of what is memory. And so, memory has been explained as a cognitive system for storing and retrieving information. It is a two part system which not only stores information, but also helps in retri uh, retrieving information. Now, as I said early days memory was uh, the idea of memory was in terms of it is a cave, it is a storage unit. or it was a wax tablet. So, these were the conceptualizations of philosophers or early scientists, but the scientific study of memory started with someone called Herben Ebengoss. Now, he was a German and he took upon himself to establish what was memory or to find out what are the parameters of memory, to find out what are the characteristics of memory. And so, he had no subject to start with. So, what he did was he started doing experiments on his own. Now, German psychologists in 1885, Haben Gauss conducted the earliest work on human memory. Some of this work holds significance today. So, what was he actually doing? He was trying to look at what is human memory and what are the characteristics of it. How did he do that? He wanted to see for how long people can remember things and what kind of information can people actually remember. So, what he did was he learned list of words. Now, obviously, if you learn list of words, the chances are that you would have used these words before. And so, there was no way to establish a baseline. There was no way to establish a minimum threshold or a baseline from where you would start measuring memory. So, there was no way to establish a zero memory state, right? Because words are there with you always, right? You have a repertoire of words, and so there is nothing called zero memory for words. So, what he did was intelligently he created something called the CVC or something called the trigram. Now, what is a trigram? A trigram is the arrangement of letters or alphabets in the English language following a CVC technique. What is a CVC technique? So, you have a constant, a three letter word which has a constant at the beginning, a vowel at the middle and a consonant at the end. And this word makes no meaning. So, it is a non word. So, if I write R A T 
this is a word, but if I write ATR, it has, it is not a word, it is an acronym for a kind of flight which is there. Or if I write something like ZOK, it does not make any meaning. So, what this Ibn Ghaz did was, he constructed words like this with a consonant, vowel consonant, but they make no meaning. And so, he made multiple list of words like this and started learning those lists. What he wanted to see is how forgetting happens and what is memory and for how long when we can store some things, what are the characteristic of things that we can store. Now, obviously, if words like this are there, there will always be a zero memory because you have not seen these words, right? These are constructed words. So, there was a zero baseline where there uh, to start with, you had no memory of it, right? And when he started learning these words again and again, so that he could come up with a state where uh, he could reproduce all the words three times without making any errors. So, started by learning list of these kind of words. So, basically what he did was he was memorizing and recalling nonsense syllables. So, this kind of a CVC things. Now, these are the two techniques that he used for remembering these words. One was mast and other was distributed practice. So, in mast practice what he did was he took lists of CVC words. So, Ibn Goth took list of CVC words and learned them in one setting. So, like 20 lists of CVC word, each list having 100 words. So, we have 100 into 20 which is around 2000 CVC words and he did that in 1 hour maybe. That is called mass practice. In distributed practice, what happened is, so in mass practice that is what he did. So, this is mass practice. In distributed practice, what he did is what? The 2000 word were remember in this way. So, uh, first he remembered or first he learned let us say 100 words, took a break for 5 minutes, then again learned 100 words, took a break for 5 minutes and kept on doing it till he learned all the 2000 words. So, in one case he did not take any break that is called the mass practice and learn all the 2000 words which is 20 list with 100 word each in one go. In the other case, he learned 100 words, took a break, then learned 100 words and that is called the mass practice, uh, distributed practice. This is what Ibn Goss found out. This is called, this particular line is called the forgetting curve. And as you can see, the this is the percentage of data remembered and this is the number of repetitions that we have. And what he found out is that initially, what happened is that with the number of repetitions that he did, this is what was forgetting, this is how the forgetting was happening. Now, with the first repetition, as you can see, initially you have 100 percent remembrance and then it keeps on falling and the repetition come, uh, the number of words that you remember was fallen down to 20 with the fourth repetition and with the fifth repetition it became constant. With the second repetition, the second time that you learned after learning the list and he took a recall of those list. As you can see initially the number of words are 50, but after the third repetition in this case within the third repetition only 30 percent is remembered. In this case in the second in the second case you have 60 percent repetition. So, 50 percent, 60 percent and in the third repetition you have 70 percent that is there. This is the time axis as time is passing. So, as time passes the number of repetitions goes in, in, in this way. And so, the percentage of data remembered as you can see follows this curve. So, what happens is, what he found out is that Ibn Ghaz forgetting curve goes something like this. This, if this is my time axis and this is the percentage remembered. Initially, people remembered a lot of words, percentage of words remembered. And what he found out is that initially people remember a lot of words, but as time passes, it follows a asymptotic, right. So, after the fifth repetition, after the fifth hour or sixth hour, what will happen is the number of words that you remember will be almost the same, area under the curve will be almost same. And so, this is what his understanding is. What he found out is that forgetting 
follows a, a sympathet after a period of time. So, initially within the first hour you will remember more number of words, then the second hour, uh, star, uh, hour the number of words will fall sharply, but after the third, fourth, fifth hour onwards, let us say after the fifth hour, the number of words that you keep on remembering will the same that you remember after 24 hours, 48 hours and then 72 hours and so on and so forth. So, initially there is the, although the number of hour, uh, words that you remember is very much, but the forgetting will be very high initially. Now, human memory, there are two influential view of human memory. So, what we are going to do is we are going to see how does memory really function. Now, let me uh, describe a case for you and, and make you understand what is the need of memory. And so, this popular case which happened in the United States, uh, what happened is this person was uh, tortured or not tortured, this, this uh, person was threatened and some kind of life uh, uh, threatening uh, act was done by a person on, on this lady. And so, this lady identified the, the from, from when, when she got over her trauma, she identified a person uh, because when, when this life threatening act was done on her, she remembered a certain kind of a hairline. And so, from a police uh, lineup, she, she identified one person, a person uh, by the name of Wood, I do not remember the story right now, but, he, and, and, uh, uh, ident but she identified a person from the police lineup saying that this is the assailant based on the memory that she had while the uh, while the act of a uh, threatening act was performed on her which was a life threatening act now this person kept on saying that i didn't do this act but this lady identified her from the police lineup and so he went in for jail and she he this person was given a 54 year jail term after serving a lifetime so that much time now this woman was kept uh, was police kept on asking this woman are you sure about this because he is getting a very harsh sentence and this woman kept her reward saying that no this is the person I remember the hairline and that is what he did and so this person was jailed. Now uh, in spite of having a very good alibi or a very strong alibi of being somewhere else when the crime was con uh, committed the person was convicted to jail. He was a father of three had, and, and had a wife at home, had a family at home and he was a very good person, but still he was committed to jail just by the incorrect memory of this lady. Years later in the prison itself, some other uh, man uh, kept on boasting saying that I did this life threatening act on this lady and nobody caught me. And so, when this came to the uh, knowledge of uh, the, the police, uh, they came back to this lady saying that look, can you uh, do a re-identification for us? And this lady, uh, lady kept on insisting that the person who was punished or incorrectly punished was the person who committed the act on her. Now, that is what we uh, she stick to. Years later, after 10 years, a DNA sampling was done and it was found out that this man was incorrectly put into jail by a simple memory mistake by this woman. So, the DNA evidence suggested some other person who was boasting in the jail that he committed the crime and a person who did not commit the crime actually went into jail. And so, that is what so years after, after the DNA evidence, this person uh, who was incorrectly put into jail was let out and this lady had a shock of her life when she had incorrectly identified. So, this is what memory is all about, this is how strong uh, memory is and how correct and incorrect it could be. But our study here on memory, what we will be focusing on three things on memory. First, something called memory systems. Second, so the process of memory, second is memory systems. So, how many uh, types of memory is there and third what is stored in memory. So, this is the outline of this particular lecture. Let us start by looking at the process of memory. What is memory? So, psychologists often construct models for studying mental processes. Models meet two major goals, one an accurate description and second an explanation of how the processes really work. And so, most psychologists when they are looking at mental processes, what they do is they construct a kind of a model and what models actually do is this give you some kind of a accurate description of what they are and how the model actually works or how the process actually works. So, psychologists have proposed two influential models of human memory and they have been discussed. So, memory process 
is what we will be looking at first. How does memory really work? And in the context of something called the atkinson schieffen model and the other is the network model. So, what is the atkinson schieffen model all about? This model of memory is akin to memory systems in computers. The model is also called the modal, modal model or the information processing model of memory. Now, before we go to the atkinson schieffen model, let us look at something called the memory process. What do we call memory? An atkinson schieffen model is a model which actually explains this memory process. So, researchers propose three basic tasks of memory. Any memory task or any memory has three basic functions. One is called encoding the process through which information is converted into a form that can be entered into memory. Then there is stor storage the process through which information is retained in memory for varying period of time and retrieval is the process which is locating and accessing a specific information when it is needed in later times. So, memory process has three parts any memory process has three parts part one is called encoding which is storing information. So, encoding is also akin to uh, learning. Then there is a part 2 of any memory which is called storage. This is the process of storing information into memory and then there is a third part process which is called retrieval which is accessing what has been stored. Let us take an example and understand what is encoding, storage and retrieval. Assume that you met a friend of yours or somebody a stranger was introduced to you by a friend. So, this friend comes in uh, to you and says hello miss falna and falna please meet my friend x y z. Now, you know this friend of yours who is introducing you to another friend of his or hers and you remember the name you call this person by the name and so you are introduced. So, now you know this friend of a friend who was introduced to in the morning. Later on the day you do not see your friend, but you see your friend's friend and when you meet this person you say hello Miss Falna Falna or Mr. Falna Falna, how are you? Now, how did you learn this friend's friend name? The process is akin to what memory happens. So, when in the morning you met this friend's friend who was X Y Z and A B C is your friend, the first step is when A B C introduced X Y Z to you, this X Y Z's name was encoded into your memory. So, you heard two forms of it, right? So, A B C introduce introduces to you x y z and when you see x y z there are two codes there are two information which is entering through your sensory system one is the acoustic and the other is the visual information acoustic is the name or any definition or any detail that is spoken to you about the friend's friend for example meet x y z he is from this place or she is from this place she lives here there that kind of information is all acoustic visual is the picture or the face or any other marker visual marker of this x y z that you know so the information is encoded through two bits through two channels one is the acoustic channel the other is the visual channel after meeting this x y z you go on your doing your daily work and the name and the details of this person are stored in your memory at two distinct places one is the acoustic store the other is the visual store a face memory is stored and a name memory is stored or some other information memory is stored later on in the day when you meet this x y z alone a process of retrieval happens. When you meet this person immediately two processes the visual memory or the visual uh, storage and the acoustic storage they integrate together and then you, when you meet this person you say that first you identify the face of this person and then you identify the name of this person and then you say that hello x y z. So, you are retrieving both information the information the acoustic information is retrieved and the visual information is retrieved from where it was stored in the morning and this is how the memory works and this is what the encoding storage and retrieval process is. So, most memories have something called the memory process is encoding 
now encoding could be in terms of visual acoustic the second step in the memory process is something called storage this is how these visual and acoustic are stored so visual memory is stored as semantic code and acoustic information is stored as the phonologic code which means that information in the visual uh, field face memory is stored as a meaning face memory is stored as a image and this image has a semantic code so it is stored as a image and this is stored as a word and so it follows the phonological code and later on when it is retrieved at retrieval both this semantic and phonological code or the visual and the word combine together to form the name face relation so you now retrieve the information or retrieve the name and face of this person and you say whatever you say so let's look at the human memory the two models of human memory the first model is called atkinson and schiffen which was proposed as a three distinct system for storing information atkinson and schiffen's idea of human memory came from the basics of information processing theory and what information processing theory believes that information is stored or retrieved in a three sensory system or three store system the first store is called the sensory store where all information is gathered and depending on filters this information is passed on to a store which is a temporary store which is called the sensory uh, the short term store or the temporary store in terms of the information processing theory and if information is processed upon it moves on to something called the long term store think about human computers now computers have two stores one is called the ram the random access memory and the other is called the rom which is the read only memory now the ram is akin to something called the sensory store and the rom is akin to something called the long term store and retrieval processes are processes which happen through the cpu which can push in information so initially when the computer starts it is the ram which is storing all the information for you when you input something into the computer it is the ram which holds this information later on the processor or the process or the software package in which you are feeding the information that converts whatever you are inputting into a uh, in, in into a code now generally the computer has a simple i i on 1 and 0 code which is called the unitary code or uh, that other uh, binomial code that's how the computer stores so if for computers it is easy so no matter what you do the processor the software package will convert all information that you are feeding onto the computer into the 1 and 0 code and this 1 and 0 code is what is actually stored into the rom right or it's also called the ascii if you look at it is called the ascii code and so it stores into the rom later on when you open that same package or when you want to retrieve the same information the rom passes this code into the software package which again translates back into the information that you actually stored so when you type w onto the keyboard this w first the information that w is uh, type is passed on as an electrical impulse and this electrical impulse is then later on translated by the software package as a 1 and 0 uh, into ones and zeros which is stored in the rom the software package reads this information and displays a w, w on the screen and that's how the information is passed now akin to this is the idea of human memory which was proposed by atkinson and schiffen and so what atkinson and schiffen says is there are three types of memory uh, there are three types of memory process something called the sensory memory there is something called the short term memory and there is something called the long term memory and there is a distinction between short term memory sensory memory and long term memory atkinson and schiffen believes that human memory is a three part system the first part is called the sensory store what is the sensory store a sensory store is a store where 
all information is available. A lot of information is available in the sensory store and it can actually keep in information from all the senses, from all kind of sensory information for a very, very brief period of time. Depending on the kind of filter that you use or the attention that you use, only 1% of information or a fraction of information passes from the sensory store to the short term memory. So, what attention briefing believes is that the human memory is composed of something like this. You have something called the sensory store. This is my sensory store. So, sensory store has a number of information bits which is passing onto it. And then I have something called the attentional filter. This attentional filter will take in all this information which is coming from the environment and then decide what information to pass. So, this attentional filter is the buffer which lets you or uh, the sieve which lets only one bit of information or one kind of fraction of information to pass. This information when it is passed, it goes to something called the short term store or short term memory and in short term memory information stores for longer durations of time. So, we will look into the idea of short term store, sensory store and long term store in a minute and so here information stores for uh, let us say 30 seconds. So, generally it stores for 30 seconds, but the information that can be stored in the short term store is 7 plus or minus 2 bits of information. Further on if the information is repeated, it moves on to something called the long term store and in the long term store the information stores for unlimited period of time depending on the number of repetitions. So, what is sensory memory? It is a memory system that retains representations of sensory input for a very brief period of time. So, the what is the speciality of this store? One speciality is that huge information, huge amount of information can be stored here or can be accessed here. What else? The time of storage is less than 1 second. So, for 1 second a lot of information can be stored here. Third, we generally have raw information here. Mostly the information which comes to sensory store is raw, it is not coupled in any way, it is not encoded in uh, any way. And uh, the fourth part or the fourth characteristic of this store is that we need an attentional filter. So, an attentional filter is needed for taking in grabbing information from the sensory store and passing it to the short term store. And the fifth is that there are two or three types of sensory memory for visual it is called the iconic memory or the icons for auditory. So, iconic memory is visual in nature, then you have uh, the acoustic memory and similarly, so different different types of sensory memory are there which actually stores all kind of information. Now, akin to what the, uh, the short term memory does, short term memory can actually take in a lot of information or a lot of type of information process, a lot of type of information. The sensory store cannot do that, it has very clear cut uh, systems. So, uh, visual information will be stored as icon and auditory information has another kind of storage which is called the eco. So, not the acoustic here, visual information or sorry auditory information is stored as something called the eco and you have touch information, sensory information, pressure information and so on and so forth. So, sensory memory characteristics of sensory memory is first it can store a lot of information a number of information. The second thing is it requires an attentional filter and this attentional filter decides what information should pass. Third, information stores here is for very limited period of time. Fourth, the information here is all, almost raw, nothing is mentioned here, raw information is there. Fifth, there are different types of sensory informations. Uh, for example, visual information, sensory information is stored as the icon or there is something called the iconic store auditory information is stored as something called the eco. So, it is called the eco, uh, echoic store and so on and so forth. So, that is the uh, meaning of the sensory memory and that is the characteristic of it. Now, short term store, now if, if information passes from the sensory store or it is filtered from the sensory store, it reaches something called the short term memory. Now, what are the characteristics of short term memory? Short term memory can hold 7 plus or minus 2 chunks of item. Now, what is chunks? So, at the maximum it can uh, include 9 chunks of item, uh, at the minimum it can include nine, uh, 5 chunks of item. What is chunks of item? If a number of items, if a number of objects are classified under one category, it is called a chunk. Let us say that I give you a list of animals, dog, 
cat, rat, hat, some bear and so on and so forth. And if this list of item, uh, there are so many animals. Now, if I ask you what this list comprises of, you will say these are animals. It can be, it, the list can also be further divided into domesticated versus wild animals, but in total it is called an animal. So, taking this list and, uh, and, and giving, it a, uh, giving it a name or categorizing this list animal in under one name is what is called chunking. So, all these animals when they are or all these uh, items in the list which is uh, cat, uh, rat, hen, dog mice and into animals is what is called chunking. So, basically then items which are similar in nature when they are categorized under or when they are put under one organized under one category this is what is called chunking and so the short term memory can hold 7 plus or minus 2 chunks of item. The time, how long can short term memory store information? So, it is less than 30 seconds without repetition, without repetition. Now, generally what uh, think of short term memory in this way, what is short term memory? Short term memory holds relatively small amount of information for brief periods of time usually 30 seconds or less. Now, assume that you are been given a telephone number. Now, when you have a telephone number and uh, you are on a call and somebody gives you a telephone number to call to, what will happen? You will actually have this uh, telephone number and you will mentally repeat it and this is called uh, basically called repetition or rehearsal and if you keep on repeating this number, so you are talking to this person, some somebody on the uh, phone and he gives you a number to dial to and until and unless you keep the phone or you, if, if you do not have a diary to write this number, what you will do is you will mentally repeat this number and this is called rehearsal. So, if you keep on rehearsing, if rehearsal is performed, then information can be stored in uh, short term memory for longer durations of time. If it is not rehearsed, then within 30 seconds of time, if, some, if you are talking to someone and information is in short term memory, within 30 seconds the information will be lost until and unless you rehearse it, which means that mentally repeat it. So, basically then the storage of information is for 30 seconds. Third, the code in which information is, uh, is stored in short term memory is phonological in nature. So, mostly the information storage in short term memory is in terms of acoustic code. Generally, you hear words, you hear acoustic, you hear um, auditory code or uh, the information is stored in terms of words, in terms of uh, acoustics. That is how the information is stored in short term memory. And also, what is the forgetting in short term memory? How it is forgot, information is forgotten? Information is forgotten from short term memory through something called interference and also something called delay. Now, interference is when similar items are brought together. So, uh, if if I give you a list of words, if I give you two or three words to remember and then I do not uh, let you rehearse it and then later on when you uh, when you play back these words, it is more e it, is, it is more feasible or it is more likely that you will actually confuse D with T, B with C some kind of a thing like that and that is what is called uh, the interference. So, um, uh, materials that you have learned before or materials that you are learning afterwards that will interfere with each other and that is the code that um, that is how forgetting actually happens in short term memory. Similarly, delay if information is not used in long term uh, in short term memory for longer periods of time or information is kept in short term memory, it is not accessed for 30 seconds, you will have forgotten. How will uh, forgetting happen in sensory memory? Generally, forgetting is through a normal process. So, if not used, it is mainly decay. If information is not filtered, then uh, information is forgotten from long term memory. Now, there is something called long term memory. So, if information is rehearsed, if information is repeated in short term memory, it is passed on to something called the long term memory. And what is long term memory? It allows us to retain vast amounts of information for very lo uh, long periods of time. So, first thing, how much information is stored? A huge infinite information. So, infinite information is stored in long term memory. Second, how much time? It can store from unlimited time. Right. So, information in long term memory can be stored for unlimited time. What is the nature of information or what is the code in which it is stored? It is ma mainly stored, stored in semantic form. 
So, meaning generally information that is stored in long term memory is in terms of meaning. So, you do not have words in acoustic uh, form, you do not have words and pictures stored in, in long term memory. What is stored in long term memory is relations between objects. So, certain objects are there and what is the propositional relation between uh, them that is what is stored in long term memory and similarly forgetting happens through decay and interference and also something called retroactive inhibition. Retrieval induced forgetting or when forgetting when uh, you are trying to retrieve information from long term memory is another form of uh, forgetting that can happen. Generally, it is called the theory of disuse. So, if you do not use an information in long term memory, it is mainly forgotten. So, that is how forgetting happens in long term memory. Now, uh, what I will suggest is that if you want to have more details about that Atkinson shift in model or any of this, there is a parallel lecture which will be running this semester uh, with the present course, which is on cognitive psychology. And there what I have done is I have done an explained memory in detail. So, my suggestion for you will be to act also uh, vouch for uh, or look at lectures on, on my course on cognitive psychology especially on memory and that will give you more information. Now, since this is an introductory, introductory course we are just touching base with what is memory. So, how does information move from one memory systems to another in uh, the Atkinson and Schiffen model? Atkinson and Schiffen propose this would involve the operation of active control processes that act as filters determining which information will be retained. Also, there are two basic ideas of models supported by research findings that is the suggestion that memory involves encoding, storage and retrieval and that we process different kind of memory system. So, we will we'll look into these two in, uh, in, in the minute or in the later lectures. So, basically this is what Atkinson and Schiffen basically says or the, uh, the proposal of Atkinson and Schiffen. Sensory memory the characteristic is it is a temporary storage of sensory information. Right? And this sensor information as I said could be in terms of icons, icon is basically visual in nature and the other sensory information could be in terms of auditory information which is called the echo. So, echo is the code for auditory information and similarly there are other codes. The capacity is very high as I said a lot of information can be stored here, duration less than 1 second vision and few seconds for hearing. Now, when Attention is the process which moves information from this store to the next store. So, attention is information that passes through and attentional gate is transferred from sh to short term memory. So, sensory store to short term memory the process. So, this is called the process. These are processes which move information from one store to another and these are called the store which is the where the information is stored. Now, short term memory brief storage of information currently being used. So, that is what it is it is 7 plus or minus 2 chunks capacity is limited. So, uh, 7 plus or minus 2 chunks, it is brief duration. So, less than 30 seconds and duration for which information is held is 20 to 30 seconds. Now, how is information moved from short term memory to long term memory through rehearsal? W basically, how do you rehearse an information? Now, any information in short term memory can have two kinds of repetitions. One repetition is purely repeating. So, if I give you a phone number, you can keep on repeating the digits of the phone number and that is how one way of repeating information in short term memory. The other way is you can assign this phone number to something of meaning. Let us say I give you a phone number which is uh, 9465432864 what you will immediately do is 94 is BSNL. So, that is how from your past experience you will relate that. So, 94 is BSNL, uh, 63 is a code for some uh, state and then the other uh, let us say 23 is, is a area code. So, let us say uh, 994 is BSNL, 63 is assume that it is Maharashtra and uh, then 36 is a particular city in Maharashtra let us say Mumbai. So, these three digits uh, there is uh, first six digits are now available to you. So, you know that this is a BSNL number coming from Maharashtra, Mumbai and the last four digit is your phone number and that is what is called elaborate rehearsal when you take in information from short term memory and assign it meaning or give it meaning and that is called elaborate rehearsal. So, information subjected to elaborate rehearsal or deep processing example consideration of its meaning is translating to long term memory. So, if information is processed, so there are two types of rehearsal one is called the maintenance rehearsal. In maintenance rehearsal what you do is you passively repeat information. 
So if I give you a phone number and you don't want to store it for longer periods of time, what you will do is just repeat the numbers that is called uh, uh, the maintenance rehearsal. But if you assign the meaning to number just I explained as I explained a little bit a little while ago that is called elaborate rehearsal and when you do elaborate rehearsal information moves through the process of rehearsal from short term uh, memory into long term memory and what is it relatively permanent storage of uh, information uh, that is there the capacity is unlimited so it is infinite capacity and the duration is also unlimited infinite time. So, this is how Atkinson and Schiffen saw memory to be. Now, there is another view of memory which is called the neural network model of memory or the parallel processing model of memory which is opposing to or opposite to what Atkinson and Schiffen had explained. Now, what is the neural network model of memory? The model of memory that describes parallel simultaneous processing of information by numerous neural models in the brain, each of these processing units is dedicated to a specific task and are all interconnected. Now, what Atkinson and Schiffen says is that there are three stores and two processes to in which uh, information is stored into your memory. But then we know of systems or we know of uh, the fact that information does not pass um, from one store to another or there is there is something called parallel processing in the brain which means that you can process a number of information together. It is not sequential which means that uh, when something is given to you, one information is given to you, it is not stored in a sequential way. Information can be processed in multiple ways right. So, and on one end you can process a poem, you have you can remember a poem but on the other end you can also remember who wrote this point all this kind of information is there which means that there are parallel processes which is happening in the memory and that is what the neural network model says. It says that uh, parallel uh, processing of information happens in the in the human brain by different neural models in the brain. For example, if you are remembering the face of the person who is writing the uh, or the picture of the person who wrote the poem, then it is a different visual system which is being active and if you are also remembering the poem or learning the poem, it is the auditory system which is being uh, the, which is being activated. And if you if uh, the story of this person is being told, you also start feeling something about this person. So, it is another area which is the amygdala or the feeling area of the brain which is also being active. And so, at the same time multiple uh, areas or multiple sensory organs or multiple uh, channels of information is active. Now, each of these processing units is dedicated to a specific task and are interconnected. Let us look at uh, is the best example is to look at RTO numbers, card numbers. So, if you look at that you have digits, numbers, uh, digits sorry alphabets digits alphabets digits. Now, if you look at that if I want to process a number like this is easier to process because what happens is this is the alphabet and so alphabet is processed by some other form of uh, brain or some other area of the brain this is digit. So, it is processed by some other area this is alphabet so some other area and some other area. So, this is the visual area and this is the uh, or uh, this is the alphabet area and this is the digit area of the brain. So, mathematical area versus linguistic area. So, linguistic area and mathematical area they simultaneously work together and when they work together it is easier for you to remember your RTO number or your car number than if it was something like that ASZ 2164 right because here what has happened is parallel systems do not work. So, first this has to be processed and first the three letters have to be pro the three uh, alphabets have to be processed and then the three digits have to be processed. In this case alphabet gets processed. So, it gets time the, the area the re region which is processing the alphabet gets time and then the uh, region processing the digit happens and then again the alphabet and the digit. So, both of them are getting time and both of them are parallel processing and so partial information can also be remembered. Now, MacLellan and Rummelhart in 1981 suggested that human processes uh, processes for 26 different letters, 16 letter features and more than 1000 words that is what humans have. They have 16 different letter processing system in the brain, they have 16 letter features to be identified. So, remember the letter feature uh, which we looked uh, which we looked at in perception. So, you have this angle, this angle, this uh, uh, this and this and this could mean a K or a P because K will have this, this, this and P will have this, this and this and similarly we can also have a D which is this and uh, this together right. So, this is the kind of 
letter featuring system and 1000 words which the human lexicon can have, human memory can have. So, when we encounter a string of letters such as uh, such as pen, these neurons are activated in parallel at the same time. Now, neural network models suggest that it is the rich interconnectedness of our neural units that account for our ability to process information so quickly. These modules also propose that information in memory is not located in a specific place within the brain, rather it is represented by patterns of activation that spread over many processing units and by the strength of the activation across various units. What does it mean? It says that information processing through the neural network model says that it is not one system which is processing information and it is not one area which is processing information. There are multiple modules, there are multiple systems and there are multiple areas in the human brain which process information in parallel. So, uh, <coughs> if I am processing pen, how it is happening is one area of the brain is processing the basic features. So, when I am processing pen, for example, one area of the brain is processing things like these these kind of letter forms, right. The other area of the brain is actually processing words, for example, pen or a three letter word starting with P, it could be pet, but it has to have this kind of a thing and so all these words are available, all these letter forms are available and a third area of the brain is also there which integrates takes in this information, takes in this information and compares this information and this information to the letter pen and then makes a decision that pen is what is being processed. Also it says that uh, the human memory is not located at one place, there is no one memory area in the brain, rather memory is distributed all across the brain. For example, there is a region of the brain which is called the amygdala or the uh, basolateral nuclei or there is a region of the brain uh, which is called the limbic system. Now, this limbic system is responsible for holding emotional memory. There is a region of the brain which is called the temporoparietal region which, uh, which holds uh, some kind of spatial memory or there is a region of the brain which is called the hippocampus which, uh, which holds another kind of memory which is called the, uh, the recent memory, spatial memory. There is a region of the brain which is called the neocortex which, hold, which holds all kind of memories and then the occipital region or the occipital association area which holds visual memory and so there are different regions of the brain which holds different kinds of memories and all these information interact together to form the whole memory that you actually see. So, then let us look at this for example, if the stimulus is the boy, now how is the boy processed? If you read the boy, how it is processed? Now, what will happen is? there are different processing unit. This is called the bottom up processing unit or this used is the bottom up processing unit and this is called the feature processing unit. Now, the feature processing unit what it will do is it will separate these letters into its basic constituents what they are made of. So, I have this kind of a angle, this kind of a line, this kind of a semicircle, this kind of a diagonal, this kind of a diagonal in the boy. So, this processing unit is called the feature processing unit and this is called the bottom up process. Similarly, this is called the top down process or I would say word processor. So, this is my word processor and this is my feature processor. So, feature processor is used bottom up processing and word processor is top down processing. So, the what the word processor will say is a letter or a word which starts with T and has two more words into it, which should have this uh, two vertical lines and one horizontal line, right. And in the third letter, so second letter should have two horizontal, uh, two vertical lines and one horizontal line and the third letter should have three horizontal lines and one vertical line. And so because you are seeing vertical and horizontal lines. So, the only possibility is T H E in this case. So, a word starting with T ending with H. In this case, we you we have already know that it is it is the B and so, two more letters have to be there, one a full circle, the other two diagonals and a vertical. So, two diagonal from different shape and so, obviously, it is the boy and the connection that you are seeing is. So, T uh, for H this is there this is there, but this is not there and so this is this is this connection is not 
this or this this feature is not present and that is why you are seeing this this particular thing this feature is present this feature is present and so you are seeing activating things also in this this is present this is present so you are seeing this as activating and these are uh, as deactivating or inhibitory so these are excitatory connections these are inhibitory which means that if this feature this feature if if this feature and this feature is present you will have excitatory connection which means that these are approved but this feature is not present in the and so it is not approved and so you will see a dot like that but these arrows says that these features are present similarly from the word unit from the uh, from the word side what will happen is not only will these features will be processed but what will happen is the word uh, since we also have a word store the word store is also uh, acting and what it is looking at is how many words can we form with these features in line and so you only get the and that is why the voice that is how it is processed so when we are processing a letter or a sentence this is how the processing happens both at from the word uh, from the word end of it and also from the feature end of it and that is that is how the neural network model works neural network model says is that processing happens both at the feature level and at the word level but atkinson and schiffen doesn't say that it says that processing happens only at the short term memory in the short term memory and that happens only either using the phonological code or the semantic code depending on what kind of memory that you are using so this is the primary difference between the attention and schiffen and the attention and schiffen model and the neural network model now what kind of information is stored in memory human memory is capable of holding a variety of information starting with factual to general knowledge action and also future intent so uh, uh, is the list of information that is stored in memory now does this mean that we have different separate memory systems or a single system involved in all kind of mes uh, memory now since human memory can store information which is related to facts and general knowledge it can also have memory to action and also to future things so it has been found out that human memory is both implicit and explicit in nature implicit meaning that there are certain type of memory that you are not aware of for example how do you ride a bicycle or how do you uh, play a violin now these things you cannot uh, tell or cannot explain and so this, these are implicit forms of memory similarly there are other forms of memory which are explicit in nature you can describe what is happening you can describe how you are playing a chess or you can describe the name of the president and so on and so forth and those are explicit form of memories so all kind of information is stored and then now the question is whether there are different kinds of human memory or is there one single kind of human memory and multiple processes which is working on to it so what we'll do is we'll take a break here and we'll continue with this lecture in the uh, next class so i'll do a quick recap of what we did today we looked at what is human memory and we looked at the basic features of human memory of how it actually functions i gave a uh, some some kind of a history of how human memory research started and then we looked at what human memory is in terms of encoding storage and retrieval further to it i also Uh, explain two basic models of human memory the attention schiffen model which shows that human memory com is composed of three stage and two processes and that's how human memory is composed of and the neural network model which says that human memory is not a singular system rather or a stage system what happens is human memory has multiple or uh, modules which process multiple kind of information at the same period of time and that's what human memory is all about now in in the next class that we do we look into what is the idea of working memory and how it replaces the idea of short term memory and we'll also look at something called long term memory and the kind of information which is stored in long term memory now again my request to you would be to go back to my other uh, lecture which is on cognitive psychology and maybe uh, spend some time with it view it because in on those lectures what has happened is i have gone into detail in explaining these features or these kind of uh, uh, topics which is their memory and learning and so on and so forth because since this is an introductory course so what i'm doing is i'm just touching base and explaining to you the very basics of uh, these uh, uh, these these concepts and trying to explain to you how this works in explaining human behavior but if you go into my other lecture on cognitive psychology we have dealt with these topics in detail and these cognitive process in detail so until we meet again in the next lecture it is goodbye from here